All right, thank you everyone for coming to the Graphs and Matroid seminar. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Ben Moore, who was uh, my pre-COVID office mate. Uh, and he'll be talking about a density bound for triangle tree for critical graphs. I mean, we're still office mates, technically, I think. But... <laughs> All right. uh, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about a density bound for triangle free for critical graphs. And uh, this is joint work with Evelyn smith Robert, she's a PhD student at Okay, so the talk's about coloring. So I figured I should define coloring, even though everyone knows what a coloring is. So I figured I would at least use a definition that people don't usually use to make it a bit more interesting. So we'll define coloring via graph homomorphisms. So if I give you two graphs, G and H, and some map that maps the vertices of G to the vertices of H, such a map is a graph homomorphism if uh, every edge of G gets mapped to an edge in H. And in the particular event that H is a complete graph, um, we say that uh, a complete graph on K vertices, then we say that it's a K color. Okay, now that we all know what a coloring is, we can go on to something a bit more interesting. Um, so the results in that I'm going to talk about are motivated from Groch's theorem. So are motivated by Groch's theorem. So Groch's theorem says that triangle free planar graphs are three colorable and uh, it's a pretty sharp theorem in the sense that you can't turn triangle free into just all planar graphs for many reasons, in particular K4 maybe. and. Uh, also, you can't improve the genus at all because there exists a triangle free uh, graph embedded in any surface other than the plane that requires four colors. So I drew one here, it's the Milchelsky of C5, otherwise known as the Groch graph. And it's pretty easy to see that it needs four colors and that it embeds in any surface except the plane. Okay. So if you wanted to try and, you know, if you like this theorem and you wanted to prove things similar to it, you, you have to think at least a little bit on how, how you're going to do it. But one thing you might try, is, or you might notice, is that the Groch graph, for instance, has a lot of four cycles. So you might think, maybe if I just get rid of all the four cycles and I go to a higher surface, then I can get a somewhat similar theorem. And this turns out to be a good idea. So Carson Thomason in 1994 proved that all girth five graphs embeddable in the torus projective or projective plane are three colorable. And Robin Thomason and Burrard Walls in 2004 proved that girth five graphs embeddable in the Klein bottle are three colorable. And just like Roach's theorem, uh, these theorems are tight in the sense that if you go to higher surfaces or higher genus surfaces, uh, there exists girth five graphs which embed in that surface and aren't three colorable. Uh, there's only finally many minimal ones, but there are some obstructions. And you can reduce growth five to say growth four just by the growth graph. And there's infinitely many, so you can do that. So you have to, again, think a little bit on how you could possibly extend uh, these theorems if you wanted to at least try to do that. Uh, it, Making the girth higher is kind of uh, dumb. You probably shouldn't do that because then you get vertices of degree two uh, fairly quickly. And then it's just trivial because if you have vertices of degree two, you just delete the vertices of degree two or less, create some ordering, uh, two degenerate ordering, and then it's immediate that there's three colorful. So here are two questions, which I think you could do that don't just make the problem trivial. Uh, so you could try and put some conditions on the four cycles uh, so that you could prove a theorem like this. So you might, for instance, maybe ask if the four cycles in your graph are really far apart, then maybe you can uh, get some theorem that looks like this or something. There's lots of possible conditions you could put on four cycles to, to possibly try and extend the results. And a different question would be something like, can we, like, is the reason that the Thomason and Thomas Walls results are true, is it just because they don't have that many edges? So if, if you're a girth five graph and you embed in the torus projective plane or Klein bottle, 
then you necessarily don't have that many edges. So you might ask if that is the only reason that, uh, or if that is the reason that they're free color. Okay. So, uh, yeah, those are the questions we're going to answer in the talk. Uh, as a spoiler, the answer to the second question is a hard yes. You basically don't need to talk about the surfaces at all. You can just say that graphs with a few edges are three colorable. And the answer to the second question, or the first question, is just you can have as many four cycles as, as you'd like, so long as you don't add too many edges. So really the only thing you need to make sure is that you don't have that many edges. Okay, so I'll try and make that a little more formal. So what do I mean by not having that many edges? I really mean that the maximum average degree is bounded. So the maximum average degree of a graph is just the maximum overall subgraphs. We take two times the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. So the maximum of the average degree of every subgraph. And uh, Euler's formula, says that every graph with growth five embedded that embeds on the torus project planar client model has maximum average degree of most 10 thirds. Okay. So you could ask the question if every graph with maximum average degree of most 10 thirds emits a three color. Now that's false. So to see that we'll use critical graphs. So a graph is k critical if uh, g, if it's k colorable but not k minus one colorable, and all proper subgraphs are k minus one colorable. So it's a minimal graph uh, with respect to not being k minus one colorable, and the minimum it's minimal with respect to both edges of vertices. Okay. So uh, a pretty old construction that was found a bunch of times by Orr, Dirac, and Hayosh says that there's infinitely many four critical graphs whose edges equals five times the number of vertices minus two over three. So this notation here, little e of g is just the number of edges and little v of g is the number of vertices. So if you take that equation and you multiply by two and divide by the number of vertices, it says that there's infinitely many four critical graphs whose average degree is 10 thirds minus a little bit, so minus little, little bit. And that disproves this question on the previous page. So does every graph with maximum average degree and most 10 thirds emit a three coloring? No, because these graphs have maximum average degree strictly less than 10 thirds and they're four critical, so they don't have a three color. But uh, you might notice that the graphs I drew here, which are two of the graphs that they constructed have a lot of triangles. So you might say, okay, well, maybe you can't just say maximum average degree of most 10 thirds, but maybe you can say something like maximum average degree 10 thirds plus girth five uh, suffices. Maybe, maybe that's good enough. So uh, it turns out that works. So towards this, Sasha Kostachka and Matt Yancey in 2012 proved that every four critical graph has its number of edges being at least five times the number of vertices minus two over three. So the average degree of every four critical graph is really close to 10 thirds, but possibly slightly under. And uh, Liu and Basel in 2014 proved that uh, if you're a four critical graph and you have girth five, then your number of edges is at least five times number of vertices plus two over three. So it doesn't look like it changed that much. It just went from minus two to plus two. But with respect to these coloring results, uh, that's enough to, to uh, prove prove these, these results, right? Because the Leo Postle result says that if you're a four critical graph and you have growth five, then your average degree is strictly above 10 thirds. And so to, to prove the two coloring results, so every growth five graph embedded on the projective plane torso climb bottle is three colorable, you just have to say, okay, take a minimal counter example to that claim. Uh, it will be four critical by minimality by the Liu Postle result, it'll have average degree strictly bigger than 10 thirds. But by Euler's formula, all such graphs have average degree 10, at most 10 thirds. And so that's a contradiction. Okay, so that answered the second question I asked was, does sparsity suffice to prove the coloring claims? But it doesn't answer the first question at all, which is about how many four cycles can you allow? Because as soon as you add one four cycle, 
the legal policy result does nothing. You, you can't say anything at all. Uh, they did conjecture that uh, Girth 5 was irrelevant. So they conjectured that uh, every triangle free for critical graph has its number of edges being at least five times the number of vertices plus five over three. And uh, if this were true, it would be best possible for the Grotch graph, which we already see. Now, if you read the header, this is a false conjecture. So uh, James Davies proved that there's infinitely many triangle free for critical graphs whose edges uh, equals five times the number of vertices plus four over three. So I drew one here. This is the smallest one. And it's also the most interesting one. Uh, it's pretty easy to get infinitely many once you have one, but this one, uh, so this one's pretty nice. Uh, we're not gonna check why it's four critical or triangle free or even why the number of edges equals that amount, but you can check that it works. Um, yeah, so the conjecture is false, but uh, we still managed to do somewhat close to it. So uh, Evelyn and I proved that every triangle free for critical graph, uh, its edges is at least five times the number of vertices plus two over three. Okay, and so again, this just says that we can recover these coloring results uh, about girth five, coloring girth five graphs embedded on surfaces where without really talking about the surface at all, and also just allowing as many four cycles as you want, so long as you don't push the maximum average degree too high. Okay. So I'm gonna try and convince you that this is true for the rest of the talk. And the first thing to do is to state what we actually proved because we didn't prove the statement as written here. We proved a stronger statement mostly for the purposes of induction. Um, and I actually don't know how you would prove uh, this theorem without proving a stronger statement. It's uh, not clear at all what you get by just thinking about triangle free four critical graphs. It's much easier to think about all four critical graphs and then prove a stronger statement by induction. Okay, so it takes a bit to describe the statement. So we have to go through that. So the first thing to, to to do is discuss or compositions. So here's the definition. It's a big wall of text, but it's not so bad. Uh, if I give you two graphs, H1 and H2, uh, the or composition of H1 and H2 is obtained by doing the following. You, you take an edge in H1, you take a vertex in H2, you split the vertex of H2, and then you merge them together in however you want. Such, such a composition is an or composition. And uh, the class of graphs that we care about the most are the four graphs. Uh, so a graph is four if you can, if it can be obtained from some number of K4s via or compositions. Okay, so we'll do an example. Here's the or composition of two K4s. Uh, it's the or composition just because K4 is small and also symmetric. Generally, there's many different possible or compositions. But, okay, so here's two K4s. You pick an edge in one of the K4s. You pick a vertex in the other K4. You delete the edge in one of the K4s. You split the vertex in the other K4, and then you smunch them together and you get a new graph, which is the Moser spindle. So that's our compositions, and this is a four or graph. Okay, so that's four graphs. Um, we're going to state the theorem in terms of potentials. So what is a potential? Um, well, first we need to define this function T of G, which is just the maximum number of vertex disjoint triangles in the graph. And the potential of a graph is just five times the number of vertices minus three times the number of edges minus the number of vertex disjoint triangles. So if you've never seen this before, just imagine if you got rid of the, the triangle part, so if you just drop this, then what the function says is if the, if the potential is positive, then the maximum average degree, or the, sorry, the average degree is less than 10 thirds. And if the potential is negative, then the average degree is bigger than 10 thirds, except we're weighting by 
vertex is joint triangle, so it's kind of skewed, but it's basically a metric of how close your average degree is to 10 thirds, where positive means you're under 10 thirds and negative means you're above 10 thirds. Okay, so we need one more thing, um, which is mostly just annoying. Uh, so there's this graph class, which didn't even give a, a name really, aside from calling it B. It consists of this graph T8, which is this graph here on the left, and uh, all graphs that are obtained from taking a four graph and T8 and then or composing them in such a way that the resulting graph has two vertex joint triangles. You can promptly forget about these. You just needed them to state the theorem. Okay. So what we proved is that if I give you any four critical graph, then its potential is one if your graph is K4, potential is zero if your graph is four with two vertex joint triangles, potential is minus one if your graph is the five wheel, so it's a five cycle plus a ver apex vertex. Uh, your graph is four with three vertex destroyed triangles, or your graph is in this special graph class B, and uh, your potential is negative two otherwise. So uh, I guess the first thing to do is to probably check that this theorem actually implies what I claimed about triangle free four critical graphs. And uh, so if your graph is triangle free and four critical, um, this T of G is zero. So the potential is just five times the number of vertices minus three times the number of edges. So it really is just capturing what the average degree is of a graph relative to 10 thirds. And the first three bullet points here all have triangles basically by definition, except for the five wheel and K4, but they have triangles. So if you're triangle free, you end up in this last class, which is the potential is the most negative two. And uh, yeah, then just rearranging this gives you exactly what I want. But that every four triangle free four critical graph has its number of edges being at least five times the number of vertices plus two over three. Yeah, so now I'm going to try and sketch this. Okay. So, I mean, the idea, what we want to do is basically show these triangle free four, four well, we want to show four, four critical graphs have average degree bigger than 10 thirds aside from some special graph classes. So it's useful to note that every four critical graph has minimum degree at least three, because if they had a vertex of degree at most two, you just delete them and then extend the coloring. So really, if you have low average degree, then the only possibility is that a lot of vertices of degree three exist in the graph and they're also adjacent to each other. So what you would really like to prove is that in a vertex minimal counter example, every vertex of degree three is adjacent to at most one other vertex of degree three. If you could prove that, then uh, I claim that the average degree of, of, of any such graph is, is 10 thirds. Uh, and to see that you just, it's just a basic discharging argument. Um, you get, assign every vertex its degree as its charge. Uh, vertices of degree at least four give one sixth charge to all the vertices that they, they neighbor that are degree three. Uh, and then that's it. So you just check the final charge. Uh, vertices of degree three, because they see at most one other vertex of degree three, they get one sixth plus one sixth charge, which is a third. So they end up with three and a third charge, which is 10 thirds. And uh, vertices of degree, say four, they may lose four sixth charge, which is, so you get four minus four six, which is three and a third, which is 10 thirds and you're done. And it's the same if your degree gets higher. In fact, it gets better for you. So that's what you want to prove. That would give you that your average degree is 10 thirds. It doesn't actually prove the claim because we wanted average degree strictly bigger than 10 thirds. But if you follow that argument that I just gave, it's not so difficult to see that so the tight examples are three colorable. And so that would be enough to to push the, the average degree above 10 thirds. Okay, but we don't actually manage to prove that. So what we prove is something worse. We prove that if there is a vertex of degree three adjacent to two other vertices of degree three, then as compensation for this annoyance, 
you get uh, at least two vertex destroying triangles. Um, and if you look at the, the graph induced by the degree three vertices, then each component contains at most six vertices. And it's actually acyclic as well. So that's, that's what I'm gonna try and convince you is true. And then after that, there's a discharging argument and uh, everything works out. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, a really useful theorem is the kostachka yancey theorem. Uh, so this was proven in 2012 and 2014. So it says that every four critical graph has uh, its number of edges being at least five times the number of vertices minus two over three. And uh, equality holds if and only if your graph is four or. So they, they actually prove this for all K critical graphs, but we only need the one for four critical graphs. Or for four critical graphs. And uh, it's a corollary. We get that if I look at any four critical graph with regards to our potential function, the potential is at most two minus the number of vertex destroying triangles. And uh, in the event a four critical graph isn't four or the potentials at most one minus the number of vertex destroying triangles. Um, yeah. Okay. So this allows you to pick off the special cases, or most of them anyways. So, uh, yeah, so to prove like the special cases in our theorem, it, aside from the special class B and the, the five wheel, it suffices effectively to show that K4 is the only four graph with one vertex disjoint triangle and every four graph contains at least one triangle. Uh, and that would apply it has two, two triangles. And in fact, the vertex is Okay, so how do you do this? Well, this is really easy. It's just, just induction. Um, so K4 clearly has one vertex destroying triangle. So take some four graph. It is the or composition of two other four graphs. If they both aren't K4, then you have two vertex destroying triangles in both of them. And you just have to observe that deleting an edge reduces the number of triangles by one, vertex destroying triangles by most one. And splitting a vertex reduces the number of vertex destroying triangles by most one. So you started with four triangles, you put them together, you lost possibly two, you end up with two. And uh, I mean, that's effectively that proof, except for if one of those two graphs was K4, in which case you observe that if you split a vertex or delete an edge in K4, you still have a triangle left over. So when you put the induction back together, it still works. Okay. And so again, I just put the Moser spindle here. It's the, K, it's the base case where you have two K4s. All right, so now past that, we can do something a bit more interesting. So the whole point of going, uh, making a statement about all four critical graphs is to apply induction. And the driving force of the induction in a paper and pretty much every paper on the potential method uh, is this notion of a quotient homomorphism. So what is that? Uh, you take your four critical graph, although you could do it more generally, but we're just talking about four critical graphs. You take some induced subgraph, uh, which isn't all of G. It has a three coloring by criticality. So you take those, take some three coloring and you look at its color classes. So uh, C1, C2, C3. And then all you do is you take each of the color classes and identify each of them down to a vertex. So there's some nice properties of this quotient, which is why you use it. So the first thing to note about the quotient is that the number of vertex just on triangles goes up by at most three. And that's just because you added at most three new vertices. So every vertex just on triangle uses possibly one of the new vertices. So your number of triangles goes up by three at most. This is the whole reason why you use vertex just on triangles instead of triangles. If you use triangles, then when you do this quotient, you have no control. The number of triangles could go up arbitrarily. But when you use vertex or join triangles, it goes up by three, and then you can actually hope to do something. Okay. And I mean, we were trying to use induction, so we best get some graph that isn't three colorable, and indeed the quotient is not three colorable. 
And this is also very easy. Uh, if the quotient was three colorable, you just look at some vertex, one of the new vertices you got, whatever color it gets, you give its corresponding color class, all of, all of the vertices in the color class get the same color and you leave everything else the same. Such a coloring would be a three coloring and then that would be a contradiction because we started with a four critical graph. So just in case that wasn't super clear, here's just a picture of a quotient. It's pretty straightforward. You have some, you pick some subgraph F, you write it as a color class, possibly three, it doesn't have to be three, but could be three. Then you just identify all of the vertices in each color class down to a single vertex, uh, and that's it. And hopefully this convinces you that the number of triangles goes up by most three, and also that the quotient isn't three colorable, because again, if it were, whatever color say C1 gets, you just color the whole color class the same. Okay. So that's quotient homomorphisms. And the real upside is that you get this counting lemma, which is usually called the potential extension lemma. And uh, it's, it's a bit of an annoying, some annoying definitions. And even the statement doesn't look that nice, but it's actually quite straightforward uh, once you stare at the definitions long enough. So what do you have? You start with by taking the quotient of some subgraph F the quotient isn't three colorable by that observation. So you get some four critical subgraph in the quotient. Call this the extension. Now you want to say something about the your original graph G. You took a quotient, you want to say you want to pull back the quotient and say something interesting. So you let F prime be the subgraph in your original graph that mapped to W plus whatever you quotiented. Call this the extender. And then because you eventually want to say something, you're applying induction, you need to talk about the vertices in the quotient that weren't in the original graph. So just call these guys X, call them the source. And so if you absorb those definitions uh, and stare at them for a bit, uh, if you take a vertex minimal counter example and you take any, any uh, subgraph, then uh, it turns out you can bound the potential of the extender by whatever you were trying to quotient plus the four critical graph and then an offset term which basically looks like the potential of the source graph but it's not quite that it's pretty close though so we're not going to prove this but it's actually very straightforward it's just writing down the number of vertices and number of edges in, in this and number of triangles in these subgraphs Okay, so here's a picture, which I don't know if it makes it any better or not, but we'll see. So uh, you, uh, you have your graph F that you're trying to quotient, you quotient it, you get a subgraph W that's four critical, it's K4 here, so it's, it's a four critical subgraph. You, so this, the source X is just this vertex C3, it's the only vertex in G, the quotient that isn't in G. And so when you map it back up to the original graph, you get this graph F prime, which is the entire all of F plus the three other vertices that were in the K. And proving the potential extension lemma mostly suffices to just look at this picture and for long enough and then it's fine. Okay. So the whole point of doing that is to prove that uh, in a, in a vertex minimal counter example, every subgraph except for the entire graph has large potential. In particular, it has potential of most two, at least two. You can also characterize equality if you so desire, but the main upshot is that every, uh, every subgraph has high potential. And this is also not difficult, right? So how, how would you prove this? You just, take your subgraph, you suppose you take a, take a subgraph that's the largest subgraph possible that is a counterexample. So we'd have potential say one or something. Now you do a quotient and then you look back at this bound and what you would find is that either F prime contradicts your choice of subgraph, F prime would be bigger and it would be a smaller graph because of this bound or it's the entire graph and then you rearrange everything and you get two. That's pretty much it. Okay, 
So the whole point of doing that is basically just to prove that a min minimal counterexample does not contain K4 minus an edge as a subgraph. And how you should think about it is just that you check the potential of K4 minus an edge and it's, you would hope that it would be less than two and then that would be enough to say that the, that subgraph isn't in your, in your graph. That's not true and it actually takes quite a bit of effort to prove this, but, but basically you should just think the, the potential of K4 minus an edge is too low, so it doesn't exist in the, in the graph. So it may not look like it, but proving that is actually pretty important. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to forbid these things called identifiable pairs. So um, what is an identifiable pair? Um, you take some subgraph of your, uh, of your graph, it's induced, an induced subgraph. Then a pair of vertices is an identifiable pair if when I add an edge, this edge to, a, to the subgraph, so if I add xy to the subgraph, then th the resulting subgraph is not three colorable. So another way of saying it is that in every three coloring of f, which exists by criticality, x and y get the same color, okay? And it turns out that a vertex minimal counterexample does not contain any identifiable pairs. So how, how do you prove this? Well, you do the only thing that you can, which is assume that you have a subgraph and an identifiable pair. You add the edge. It's not three colorable. So there exists some four critical subgraph. And the whole idea is you have this four critical subgraph. You would like to look back, you know, delete the edge. This is some subgraph of your original graph. You would win if that subgraph had potential one or less because all subgraphs have potential at least two. So that, that would be a winning situation. So how, okay, but you might note if you've tracking this, that that isn't really true. So the whole point of proving that your a vertex minimal subgraph does not contain K4 minus an edge as a subgraph is that when I add the edge to this graph, I don't get K4. And K4 was the worst case in the induction hypothesis. So you can strengthen what you get by induction. And that basically is enough to say that the subgraph has too low potential. That's the idea. Okay, so that's how you prove this. Um, you might not think that this is also that useful. I mean, it's, it's not really clear why, why this is that useful, but it turns out this is pretty useful. So uh, this implies that a minimal counterexample doesn't have any cycles of degree three vertices. Um, okay, so how, how, is, how is that? Well, again, you suppose you have a cycle of degree three vertices. So you have a cycle and all of the vertices in G have degree three. You look at its neighborhood, which I called I, uh, if, if the neighborhood is just a single vertex, then your graph is a wheel and uh, you just check that wheels aren't counterexamples. So the set I has at least, at least two vertices. And I claim that every pair of vertices in I is an identifiable pair. And uh, so to see that, you just suppose not. That means you have a coloring where at least two vertices here get different colors. And then what you do is you assign a list coloring to the odd cycle. So it's a two list coloring and not all of the lists are the same. And now I'll just, just greedily color from, from that. You, you, with it, it, every cycle is two list, two list colorable as long as the lists, not all of the lists are the same. So it's just, it's just a greedy argument. Okay, so that means, um, every pair of vertices in I has to get the same color, but that means they're an identifiable pair and that doesn't exist in our graph. Okay, so we've proven that the subgraph induced by degree three vertices is acyclic. Um, yeah. Okay, 
Another thing that you can prove is that every triangle contains at most one vertex of degree three. So how do you do that? You again, suppose you have two vertices in a triangle uh, and two of the vertices have degree three. We just showed that you can't have all three vertices of degree three. So two of them have degree three. So let X and Y be, uh, be vertices of degree three. Look at their neighbors, say X prime and Y prime. X prime and Y prime aren't the same vertex because otherwise you have K4 minus an edge as a subgraph. And so now I claim that X prime and Y prime are an form an identifiable pair. And for this, you can just check all possible three colorings of, of these three vertices. And you can argue that in any three coloring where X prime doesn't equal Y prime, so the colorings don't, aren't equal, uh, the coloring extends. And you, there's only so many of them you can just check. In this example, you would just color X blue and Y red, but there's a few others. It's, it's quite easy. Okay. So we're starting to get some structure on the degree three vertices, but um, it might still seem like we're quite a ways away, but uh, actually we've almost got all of the structure we need. So uh, we need to prove something about four graphs, which is kind of a miracle. Uh, it turns out that Aside from the graph I draw, drew here, which is the, uh, the Moser spindle, every four graph with two vertex disjoint triangles contains two vertex disjoint K4 minus an edge subgraphs. And if you want, you can say something about the degree three vertices in that graph. I mean, it's essential, you need to do that, but it's not so important. Um, okay. So how, you prove this just by induction. Again, you, 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 know, you, you have the OR composition. You have to just show that it preserves this property across four OR compositions. It turns out it's true. I don't know why you would think it was true, but it turns out it is. And this results in a pretty miraculous lemma that drives the entire proof through. So uh, way back, however long ago I said we would like to prove that all vertices of degree three are adjacent to at most one other vertex of degree three. And so this lemma basically says what happens if that isn't true. So if you have uh, three vertices x, y, and z, and y is adjacent to two other vertices of degree three, uh, then if you look at say x, you could also look at z, but just first you just look at x. You look at the two neighbors of X, which uh, aren't Y, and they're also not Z, because otherwise you'd have a triangle of degree three vertices. Um, so you look at these two neighbors of X, X prime and X double prime, then either those X, X prime and X double prime form a triangle, so X prime and X double prime are adjacent, or they lie in this thing, which we called an M gadget, which is just pictured here. So you either get a triangle or you literally get this subgraph in your graph. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, you suppose not like all of the other proofs in this, this paper. Um, so you have X, it has its two neighbors, X prime and X double prime, then you identify them. So they're not adjacent, so that's fine. And now the resulting graph isn't isn't uh, three colorable because otherwise you would just de-identify and give those vertices the same color. So when you identify, you get a graph that isn't three colorable. So there's a four critical subgraph. And now you look at this four critical subgraph and you ask yourself, what four critical subgraph could you get? Well, you can't get K4 because otherwise you'd have two K4 minus an edge subgraphs. And unless you're the Moser spindle, by this previous lemma, you can't get a four graph with two vertex disjoint triangles. So then by our induction hypothesis, uh, you end up in one of these two final categories, which means the potential of this four critical graph is uh, negative one or less. And uh, 
So once you have that, you look back at the, you de-identify and you find a subgraph in your original graph, you check its potential and you'll see that its potential is lack one. And that's a contradiction because we said the potential of all subgraphs was at least two. I mean, there's a bunch of cases here that I'm ignoring, but this is basically what you want to do. And so where did, the only part of the argument that's left is that what if I actually got the Molzer spindle when I identified them? Well, then you'd get the same gadget here because if you identify X and X prime, the resulting graph you get is the Molzer spindle. So, so that's the only thing that was left. And actually you can assume the Moser spindle doesn't contain Y or Z because when you identify these two vertices, X has degree two, which means it's not in a four critical subgraph, which means Y is degree two after deleting X, which doesn't have, uh, it has degree two after deleting X and then Z has degree two after deleting Y. So you can actually assume the subgraph doesn't contain Y or Z. Okay. So what does that give you? It tells you that if I look at an induced path of length at least four, where all of the vertices, so, well, you don't have an induced path of length four where all of the vertices in the path have degree three. And uh, it's just applying this M gadget lemma twice. So you have a long enough path that you can apply the lemma twice and you never end up in the, the first situation, which is that you've got a triangle in the neighborhood. So you end up in this M gadget situation twice. And then you just have to observe that this M gadget that you've got after doing it twice can't be induced because the, the vertices here have degree three. So it kind of forces things in the graph. So I drew it as you have this M gadget and then I've done it twice. And so you at least get one extra edge. It doesn't have to really look like this, but you there's at least one extra edge that you get. And then you just have to check that the potential of this subgraph is at most, or at, it's like one or something, I can't remember, but it's less than two and that's a contradiction. All right. And so at this point, we've basically proven what I claimed we proved, uh, you know, modulo most of the details. So um, this implies that if I look at the graph induced by the degree three, three vertices, then every component has at most six vertices, and that's just because we don't have any long path, uh, and it's also asymptotic. And hopefully you agree that if we actually have at least three vertices in this graph, if some component has at least three vertices, then we have triangles, and that's just this M gadget thing. The, the M gadget has triangles, and the other option in that lemma was that we had triangles, so we get triangles if there's three vertices. Okay, so at that point, if you proved all of this, then it, the rest of the work is just discharging. So I wrote down what our discharging was, although it's probably pretty incomprehensible. Um, so I'll try and explain it a bit, just because it's actually not, the rules themselves are not that tricky, although it takes a lot of time to, to actually check everything. So you do it in three steps. So the first step just says, if I'm a vertex of degree bigger than four, I send all of the charge that I can to all the, uniformly to my neighbors of degree three, uh, such that I don't drop below 10 thirds myself. And then the second step says that some vertices of degree three might have actually received too much charge. And the only time that occurs is if they had no other neighbors of degree three. And in that case, those vertices of degree three send some charge back. And then the third step just says some vertices of degree four got some charge back from the seventh, second step. They redistribute that charge uniformly to the vertices of degree three that didn't send them charge. And if you do that, and you write down a bunch of cases, you get that the final charge of every vertex is at least 10 thirds. And uh, so this implies that five times the number of vertices minus three times the number of edges is the most zero. And uh, either you have two vertex disjoint triangles 
or uh, the discharging argument implies that your your graph is three colorable unless you get this stronger inequality that says uh, you have five times the number of vertices minus three times the number, which is the most negative two. Uh, so that's you know not that clear at all, but that's that's what you do. <laughs> Okay, so that's effectively the entire proof. Um, so I just finish with a statement of what we did at the simple, simpler version, just in case you forgot, you know, in the past hour what we did. Uh, so we proved that every triangle-free four-critical graph uh, has its number of edges being at least five times the number of vertices plus two over three, and uh, so with James's uh, example and our bound, uh, we're pretty close to knowing the exact density of triangle free four critical graphs. Um, I don't really know of an application of getting a better bound, but if you could characterize when equality holds, then uh, that would be really good and probably have, make its utility quite a bit higher. Um, and you can also do, uh, you could try and do this for larger critical graphs. So the, the natural question would be to extend the results to K critical graphs not containing a large clique. And so I wrote down a possible bound, uh, which would basically be Evelyn and I's bound, the, the, the obvious generalization of that which is obtained by taking the general kostachka yancey bound and changing a negative to a positive. Um, I also don't know of any applications of that other, but I mean, if you manage to characterize when equality holds, then again, it would be uh, quite nice. So yeah, all right. I think that's, that's basically all I had to say. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, we haven't been doing applause in the seminar just because it's hard for everyone to, to time it correctly. Um, so instead, we'll just go on to questions. Uh, so are there any questions for Ben? Hi, um, I was just wondering for your question there the, with uh, characterizing when equality holds, if you go beyond the bound and you might still hope to understand a characterization for when, like for the graphs that satisfy things, even if the C is bigger than the actual lower bound, right? I mean, yeah, that would be that could be done. Uh, it would just presumably be even more complicated, right? Right. And I'm just, so what I'm what my, my question is: Is there a point where like an NP hardness result kicks in where you wouldn't expect a characterization anymore? Uh yeah, I mean, definitely, but, <laughs> well. Do you know where that is? I mean, maybe not. Maybe you could still characterize it, but maybe it would be a useless characterization. So, uh, I mean, like, Hayosha's theorem, you, you can technically generate all. Yeah, I don't mean that sort of characterization. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I don't know when the, bound would kick in and it would be too hard to characterize. I'm not sure. All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.